Hello, my name is Charles Hopkins and I'm the UNESCO chairholder at York University in Toronto, Canada. Um, let me begin by saying thank you to Dallas College for inviting me to be a part of this 10th summit and to share some of my ideas around the pursuit of sustainability but in, in this really interesting context of uh, both social justice and resiliency. One of the, the uh, discussions around sustainability usually begin with, from an environmental context. And so uh, uh, adding social justice and resiliency is a very, very interesting approach for me. I, I also, I, I love discussing this uh, in a higher education setting uh, because he can bring forward perspectives, thoughts, ideas, and so on that hopefully will stimulate some reflection and, and uh, some maybe even some intrigue. Um, I appreciate um, Dallas students and uh, I've met some of your staff and students in working with you in Salzburg and, and so on in, in Austria. Um, let, me, let me begin by this concept of uh, building a, a greener future for the world and all that live upon it, including both humans and, and um, and, and well, all life forms, uh, and especially if we think of it in the way of resiliency. I, I think of three different aspects of, of resiliency. You can see, first of all, there's the planetary or ecological resiliency. Um, th that's sort of the normal one, but adding to it the context of societal resiliency. And of course, from a the university perspective, how do we build in personal resiliency uh, for our students? Now, if we're thinking beyond resiliency and also thinking of it from a social justice point of view with ethics and values and so on, um, I, I find this quote from um, Gus Speth, an, an American, who rose to be the head of uh, the United Nations Development Program. And uh, after his work, he, he shared this thought. I used to think the top sustainability program problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. And that with good research and science, we could correct that. The real problems our selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with that, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. Now, he's not alone in saying that. But how do you bring about that, that kind of, of uh, spiritual and cultural transformation, especially in a higher education setting? So, you know, kids, I would say many people are saying, look, the role of higher education and colleges, universities, and so on, yeah, part of it is to prepare people for the world of work and, and for uh, sort of contributing to national gross domestic product and so on, but also a, a much broader uh, need for higher education, an outcome or goal of that. And, and in particular, as the world seems to shrink and become more intertwined and so on, there are the aspects of global citizenship, um, awareness of those issues that almost implode or become part of, of our life. We do reach out. Everything that we do, um, you know, is, is engaged almost internationally as well. And so what are the implications then for our education systems? What, what values, what ethics, whose values, and so on. And I would suggest for those of you who are interested in pursuing this, that if you're not already engaged with uh, or found on something called the Earth Charter, 
this is a sort of a compilation of values and ethics that were compiled by people from almost every nation in the world. And I would say, start with that and see which values and ethics you disagree with. It, it's a, a, a wonderful start for educators to introduce into their classes for discussion. I'd like to make the point that we're almost, as I say, almost all global citizens. These are photographs of a refugee camp that were just uh, brought back and shared with me by a colleague who was in this refugee camp in, in Jordan. And he was saying, he was so disappointed that although there, uh, you know, what can the world do to relieve the plight of, of refugees all around the world? Um, you know, the, just the perception of how we share this planet and the feeling that, well, they're over there, we're here, it's not really my problem and so on. Although in this case with Syrian refugees, to think of the countries that um, have caused them to become refugees and so on. So it's just one of the aspects of looking at it from a social justice perspective. Now this one, is, these are people on the other side of the world, right? And so quite often we think that, well, uh, it's not our problem. We have enough problems right here and so on. And I want to point out that often social and uh, in, injustice and um, that these result in attacks on our resiliency. There are issues that are there and that uh, they actually do become manifest and affect everyone. So let me explain the next couple of charts. One is looking, if you look on the right, you will see life expectancy, uh, literacy, uh, infant mortality and so on. You can see the list of issues. Then if you look at the graph, you will see the horizontal axis across the bottom of income inequality. So a social justice issue, the difference between the very wealthy and the very poor, the gap right, that is there. And then on the vertical axis on the left, you see those countries that are doing at the bottom, that are doing well, and uh, then as you get worse, as you go up through the graph. So you see in the bottom left-hand corner, countries like Japan, and then clustered around uh, the next in line of the Scandinavian countries, are countries where these social justice issues that are listed are, are minimal. And then as you go out the line, you find the countries uh, that uh, you can see Canada's about halfway out the line. And they're, okay? So these are the, are the problems that are totally linked with the poverty gap. We quite often do not, we think of addressing abject poverty, but we very seldom talk about ad addressing abject wealth and so on. But these, you know, these are issues that are actually right here at home. We can bring it down from the international and uh, comparison of nations right down to the comparison of uh, the United States. And so down where New Hampshire, uh, what is it, Utah, Wisconsin, and so on seem to again be doing a little bit better. And then as you go out the line, you'll see huge wage disparities and income disparities, for instance, in New York and so on. And, uh, and huge, but uh, only sort of median in the, the problems around these issues. But we go up here, you see huge problems around these issues. And again, out this far on income inequality um, only uh, exceeded um, by New York. So, okay. so these are the are sort of bringing the, the help of the uh, bringing this home. 
in, in a local resilience kind of context. But if we were to think globally, if we look at the World Economic Forum has just come out in 2020, uh, released the global risk. These are the huge issues that they feel that are, that are out there. Now, if you, uh, if you have a look, you'll see up in the top, you have environmental issues of climate change. You have extreme weather, biodiversity loss, natural disasters, and so on. Now, this was completed just before COVID came onto the scene. And so, but if you look, uh, you will see infectious diseases as a, uh, was there, both in the severity, of course, across the bottom is likelihood of it happening and going up on the vertical would be the severity or the impact that, that uh, would, would be there. So the whole idea of resilience and, and, and so on, of first of all, the individual uh, sort of issues, but what we also need to be concerned about is the implications. Right? So you would take, if we take climate change, which the world feels is the greatest long-term huge issue facing us right at, at the moment, right? then you will see that it is totally woven in, into many, many other issues, which comes up with the complexity and so very, very difficult for people to truly understand, not only is it real? Has it been happening? Of course, now we, we do know if you go to the Arctic and the ice is gone, you know, we, it is obvious. Okay. But at any rate, uh, what, will, what are the overall implications? What do we do about it? How, how do we address it? And so on. So these are, the, are the, some of the big issues. Now, all of these sort of compete into this huge global challenge. The global challenge of how can we internationally and, and adapt it within our own country, but how can we collaboratively create economic and social systems that enable individuals and communities to thrive equitably today, but also uh, do not limit future generations and you know, sustaining the capacity of the environment to support this for future generations. It is a huge issue. And as uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, the uh, ex-Secretary General of, uh, of the United Nations, when they said, well, if we can't do this, what's the backup plan? And he said, there is no plan B, there is no planet B. For it. Now, countries uh, have been trying to, to come to grips with the whole concept of progress, which is a concept that's only a couple of hundred years old. But anyway, how do we develop? How do, how, how do we progress um, in some sort of equitable, fair manner? Uh, and they've been working on this since the end of the Second World War. That's why they created the United Nations as a place to go and talk about these great international issues. It, that's all really the United Nations is, is a, a place to gather and, and, and talk. In, in trying to address the idea of how do you balance economic growth with environmental uh, concerns, the idea that emerged was called sustainable development and it came out in 1987. It was adopted by the United Nations, including the United States, of course, buying them. And then in 19, five years later in 1992, they emerged with a work plan for how, how, to, uh, how to try and address these, uh, these many issues that they had. It was called Agenda 21. Now, that was a program that ran from 1992 to the, the millennium change. This was a huge opportunity to look at the progress that had been made, refocus, come up with new targets and, and so on for the 15-year program from 2000 to 2015. They call them the Millennium Development Goals. 
in 2015, five years ago roughly, they came up with a new program and they just called it the Sustainable Development Goals. And these are 17 goals that uh, uh, have been uh, adapted for the world to address this concept of sustainable development. Now, what is sustainable development? Well, it's this attempt to balance social uh, 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 needs of equity, social justice, and so on. Pursuit of that, the pursuit of economic growth and development, and the making sure that we don't collapse an environment in doing it. So it's trying to balance these all of these three. Uh, it's the UN wording is, is here. It's development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I particularly like an African elder, an, an indigenous elder, who his definition was enough for all forever. Enough for all forever. What is enough? And I love the for all. Being an indigenous person, was he talking about his tribe? Was he talking about South Africa? Was he talking about humans? Was he limiting it to humans? And of course, being an indigenous person, he wasn't. He was talking about for all, for all life, right? and intergenerational, so on. Now, the 17 goals that we're, uh, we working with, you can see here the first one being poverty. Right? And then in line with hunger, good health, education. Education is key in, in trying to come up and addressing the resilient issues that are facing the, the future. So these are, the, are the, the 17 goals. They should not be seen as individual thrusts, but they should be taken in their entirety, especially from an education point of view, because you won't address any of the others without it, education being implied. Education, public awareness, public understanding, uh, training, all of these aspects fit, uh, fit into this. So it's especially you'll see that uh, if we if we take COVID, for instance, and then around COVID, you look at the 17 sustainable development goals that are here. Each of them are involved or uh, implicated in ad addressing the COVID um, response. But in particular, if we think of of education, the idea of pursuing and ensuring inclusive, equitable, quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. That's the aspirational goal. And in this goal, there are uh, 10 targets uh, that uh, countries are moving uh, towards and post-secondary education colleges and vocational education in, in particular is stressed at being so, uh, so important. But this means that all uh, post-secondary, all education and in, in particular post-secondary, you know, only about 6% of the world's population gets to graduate from university. But that 60% will be, or 6% will sort of be 80% of those who shape the future of the world. These educated graduates will be the political leaders. They'll be the leaders of the private sector. They'll be our poets and painters and, and will shape the arts and so on. And uh, so it's so important that we examine the responsibility of uh, higher edu education move forward. So the big issues that are there, I think it's important that higher education think of them in two ways. If we look at the issues that are there, we realize that they are not going to go away. We have to look not only as these being societal challenges, but these will shape the economy of the future. 
These issues must be addressed. And so how can we um, look at these and figure how our different disciplines, our courses uh, uh, can play a, a role in not only these that I've thrown out as examples, but the sustainable development goals themselves. So whether you're in the arts or building trades or the service industry, investment, whatever, think of relating and trying to, uh, to bring this in, into, um, into uh, being seen as an opportunity and preparing our graduates to, uh, to be able to be resilient, to thrive, and, and uh, to be able to, uh, to cope. Now, I look again at what do, how do we address resiliency and how do we address sustainability? And, and basically I look at three different approaches. The first approach is what can, what can we do to stop the problem if it is a problem, right? First of all, sort out, is this really a problem? And go back to what I was saying about, there are two different kinds of, of, of sustainability issues. The first being ongoing issues, such as the bleaching of coral reefs, the rise of sea level, so on. Things that we know uh, are happening, things that we are studying, things that um, we're trying to address. And then there are those things that are emerging that come upon us and we really don't understand. COVID is a, a wonderful example of this. How severe is it? I mean, we still don't know. Now, many countries are prepared uh, that we probably won't be able to, uh, to see any real uh, a change or, or, or uh, good news until the middle of next summer in uh, 2021. You know, but we really don't know. Um, is this going to be something like the flu shot we have to get every year once it is loose in the environment and so on? So this is what we call a wicked issue. Yeah? Wicked issues are ones that are put upon us that we really do not understand. Either the cause, the origin, the extent, will it replicate, will it not, uh, and what will be its overall impact. So the first thing is then awareness and to assess the threat and whether or not there is a need to act. And if it is established, uh, whether it's that wicked issue or whether it's something that's repeating. And then how do we go about that first step of prevention? The second, though, is saying, how can we reduce the impact if we can't stop it? How do we mitigate the overall impact? What are the things that we should stop doing? How can we ease it? How can we prepare and reduce the impact? And then the third thing is realizing, OK, if we do have to adapt, how are we going to do that? What are we going to build our adaption plans upon? And I suggest that we adapt it upon science, whether it is the natural sciences, we have to engage the social sciences. You know, every country is different on worldview and the perception of people. You know, uh, do we want to, to uh, look at the, the rugged individual, it's my rights and so on, or how do we balance uh, the individual rights with social rights, the, the rights of the many versus the right of the individual and so on. This varies from, from country to country, of course, and, and involved in there, of course, the political sciences and, and, uh, and so on. So, in particular, then, for, uh, for education, as I'm winding down now, I want to talk about, in particular, upon uh, higher education in the three big roles. First of all, teaching, and secondly, a, a couple of words about research, and then um, community service. So, <clears throat> first of all, in teaching, I want to suggest that um, this is not a great change in the way of, of, uh, of the goals of pedagogy. 
okay, it, it, whether we're learning in, in the context and so on. But if we take education theory, and I think the most common one in the United States is, is uh, the work of, of Bloom, um, where he said that there were uh, six different levels of competency and so on. In the first one, two, and three, are sort of education is a transfer of knowledge, the acquisition of knowledge and skill. Um, and in a, in a sort of uh, a, a training perspective. Okay? Then the next level higher than that is, is to take what you know and, and generalize and to, uh, and to um, create something uh, from that. Okay? And then the next levels of five and six is really creating, engaging, um, uh, being able to, to generate new insight and new knowledge, and then taking responsibility and, and, uh, and so on with, with your life. So if you again put this into kind of a chart, then and address this existing context, bring it in to dealing with resilience, with sustainability issues and so on, then in this chart that I created, uh, the vertical axis is whether or not it are if the issue is easily measured. And then across the, the bottom is this likelihood or, or uh, really the certainty of what we're teaching and what we're, what we're dealing with. Two plus two equals four, usually, right? So the certainty. Most education happens down that bottom left-hand corner, which is the equivalent of Bloom's one, two, and three. Analyzing number four, and, and then the synthesizing, the creating new knowledge and so on is as we get out that arrow into that creating, engaging, blooms five and six. This is where we need to prepare our, our students because this is the world of college, this is the real world. And it is a world of change. It is a world that is being sometimes thrust upon us. So on. And how do we alter our education system? Because we do have this wonderful opportunity with uh, learning online, being a part of it, and you know, we have time to rethink the purpose of education and so on from there. As well as the theory, there are some, I think each of you as a professor can be thinking about. Uh, what should a person know in my discipline to be able to, to thrive and to feel comfortable in this outer ring? So if we look at, for instance, just being able to understand global and large perspectives, extremely large numbers, extremely small numbers, and so on. So this one I love, it's from, uh, from uh, Noah. Uh, and uh, it's the, the idea, if you were to take all the water, oceans, groundwater, rivers, lakes, water in the atmosphere, and combine it all, you would create a, a ball of water, a sphere roughly 860 miles wide. Now, Texas is about 800 miles wide. Just to put that in perspective, the, there's just this skim of water on top of the planet. And so that's how we have to be starting to think about water resources and, and, uh, and bringing this down. But if we were to bring it in, that's from an environmental. Let's look at things from an economic perspective of dealing with extremely large numbers. If, if, what would a billion dollars look like in the hundred dollar bills? on skids, right? A standard skid of $100 bills. That's what a billion would look like. You could put it on 10 skids. What we continually talk about infusing the economy with a trillion dollars. Right? 
So what would a trillion dollars in hundred dollar bills look like? Yeah. You see the man down in here? These skids are too high. Okay? So two skids and high, and they would cover roughly three football fields. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's mind blowing, isn't it? It, it, but that, that's the kind of thing that we need to do, uh, to try and do. And how do we do all this in some sort of relevancy? So that's the teaching. If we look at the second aspect of higher education, and that being research, the uh, in, in, you know, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and so on, how can we infuse, bring purpose into our research? that would address the sustainable development goals or the local adaptation of local sustainable development goals for Texas or for Dallas and so on. So the idea of how do we bring in biomimicry, you know, the, the, the idea of looking at how things actually work in nature, what, what are the basic principles and then bringing that forward from Burdock in, uh, being part of the inspiration for Velcro, the nose of the Kingfisher is the, the, the common one for that uh, high-speed train, the Japanese uh, train on the, on the left, which is designed for going through the open area. But the train on the right is designed for going through tunnels and it uses, it's designed on the bill of the duck-billed platypus, which is a, a mammal that goes through very shallow streams and rivers without creating wake so that that train can fire through tunnels without creating all kinds of, of problems. So the idea of both purpose and biomimicry and, and design in our research in, in dealing with nature. And then the third, of course, is, is community service, engaging youth, not only uh, in faculty for both community service during school, but afterwards. It's our youth who are going to be here for the long haul. Right? And these are the people who, using our knowledge, will be able to shape a more sustainable future. The average age in the world is 29, which means technically half of the world are youth. Right? Half of the world are youth. In fact, 26 by a quarter of them are under 15. Right? In some countries, the average age, for instance, in Niger is 14 and a half. In Africa, many countries, uh, there the average age is 16, 17 years old. In, um, in North America, um, uh, it, about, uh, uh, about 17 percent are over 65, 18 percent are under. It's, it's uh, under 15. Uh, so you have that, that balance, but still, it, it is a huge amount. And so how, how do we engage, not just pass on facts, you know, not that lower level, but how do we really engage youth and, and, uh, and prepare them? So moving forward then and in closing, let me talk about something that Dallas College is pretty familiar with and has a global reputation. And that is how to bring sustainability forward in a whole institution approach. I, I, I know that you have been engaged with ASHI and, and sort of right from the early on, uh, ASHI being the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. I know that uh, you were heavily involved in developing the measurements, the STARS uh, rating system and so on, and tracking and monitoring system for, for colleges. But I want to say that you are not alone anymore. All around the world, colleges and universities are looking into their responsibility and their role in, uh, in engaging in building a more sustainable future. 
their responsibilities. And so what they are doing under the leadership of UNESCO uh, is developing something called a whole institution approach where you bring together all of the stakeholders, including the students, the learners, and developing technical financial support to, to support the plan or vision and so on, and networks both intra and inter-institutional and so on in, in, in moving forward. This is a huge 10-year program that is being launched right now within UNESCO to build on the early work that has been done. International, there are about 30 big international associations of universities and colleges. One of the largest is the International Association of Universities, and it has developed a program bringing together universities and colleges um, to form clusters around each of the sustainable development goals and uh, moving forward with that kind of leadership. The Times Higher Education Ranking System for, uh, for Higher Education is now ranking universities in their contribution. So this whole institution approach, as I say, is nothing new for you, but the idea of infusing sustainability into the very culture, the DNA, the ethos of the institution. How does it work into not only greening the campus, but greening the mind? right, and, and greening the whole institution. How do you infuse this into, uh, the, into the research? How do you bring it into, the, into your community service and so on? And as I say, into the values, the ethics, the policy, when you hire the next president, well, do you question that? When you hire faculty members and when you hire the people working in, in, in uh, your services and so on. So this whole institution is extremely important in addressing the big global issue of how, how do we reduce the footprints that each of us make every day, personally, institutionally, nationally. How do we do that? And how can we move from sort of the negative thing of uh, all of us with our ecological footback, uh, footprint, the, uh, the accumulation, which in Germany they refer to as our ecological backpack, that which we carry with us through life. And how do we take a more positive approach? And how do we address the idea of the ecological handprint, the things that we can do? And so I hope all of us hope that uh, as we go through, as we graduate and go through our life, that our collective handprints will continue to grow and uh, certainly be much larger than our footprints. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I, I hope that my presentation has been useful and uh, will continue to stir some thoughts as uh, as time goes on. Thanks again.